Well, thank you, Mary Ellen and Margaret. Good morning, and welcome to worship on a gorgeous uh, Sunday morning. Uh, we welcome you to worship, whether you're here in person or you're joining us via live stream. Uh, today is Father's Day, so we acknowledge the fathers in our midst and pray blessing upon them for sure. If you're a visitor, thanks for coming, and we hope you will want to join us again for worship. There are some visitor's cards in the pew racks. Uh, you might want to fill one of those out, drop it in the offering plate, give it to Pastor Don, or... Uh, yeah, give it to Pastor Don or drop it in the offering place. Pastor Misty is on vacation. She will return to the office tomorrow morning. Uh, the scriptures remind us that part of our faith is giving cheerfully to advance God's work in the world. The church continues to appreciate all those who express their faith by giving of their treasures and also their time and talents. Monetary offerings can be placed in the plates by the exits following the service, or you can give via our website. So as we now continue in worship, let us give an offering of praise as we stand together and sing hymn number 83, number 83. I would invite you to turn to number 673 in the back of your hymnals, and we will pray this together as an invocation prayer. Please pray with me. O oh God, author of eternal light, lead us in our worshiping this day, that our lips may praise you, our lives may bless you, and our meditations glorify you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
Scripture reading uh, for this morning may be found on page 120 in the New Testament of your pew Bibles. It comes from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, as Pastor Don continues preaching on their series from Acts. Acts chapter 3, Luke writes, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay, daily, would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. May God add his blessing to those words from the pen of Luke. Uh, let us sing together as a call to prayer, Christ, we do all adore thee. You know, when I was uh, pastoring, uh, sometimes I would come home after a long day, maybe from pastoral visitation and some counseling, and I'd be just really tired, and all I would want to do would be to vegetate. And uh, at that time, many years ago, I had uh, two daughters who were about two and four, and I would come into the house, and they were not ready for Dad to vegetate. Um, they were into some activities, and so they were just talking and chattering away, and sometimes... I would just maybe want to turn on the Phillies and watch them and not pay much attention to them. But they used to take my face and they'd say, Dad, um, I want, they, they want me to, eye contact was essential for them. Well, you know, we have a father that uh, never neglects us like that. We have a father who always, always, friends, gives our attention to us when we come. To talk to him always he's never distracted would you please pray with me God we thank you for this uh, just gorgeous day out we thank you for the opportunity to praise you and adore you for Mary Ellen and Margaret who have 
Let us in that praise and adoration for the voices of this congregation who lead us in that praise and adoration. We do adore you, Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Again, thank you for bringing us together. We do come to you this morning, though, Lord, as not a perfect people. We do sin, we do fail you, and we fail others. And we take some time this morning to confess those sins to you. O God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Again, Lord, we just thank you and praise you for who you are, for the love you have for us, and for each and every person that has come together to worship you this morning. We thank you for the many blessings, for the beauty of the earth. We thank you for the beauty of the surroundings of this place in which we live, for the produce now coming to us from fields and gardens. Oh God, we indeed are a blessed people, and we thank you and praise you. We rejoice this morning, Lord, with Ginny and Bob upon the birth of their granddaughter, Fiona. May that family adapt and adjust to the life of a new little one. We pray blessing upon three of our young people from our midst who will be going to Camp Swatara today to spend the week. Bless them. May they grow in their faith. May they be challenged by your spirit there. And yes, Lord, may they have fun. We mourn with Linda upon the death of her mother and pray for peace and comfort in that family. We pray for those in our midst who are, we pray healing for those in our midst who are recovering from surgery, facing surgery, those suffering physical pain and hurt or mental pain and hurt, we pray for their healing. We pray for peace and comfort for those who are undergoing hospice care and for those who are undergoing cancer treatment. Indeed, Lord, we pray for their healing. We pray for peace in the world, especially for those areas of the world where war ravages people's lives and lands. Foremost in our mind is the Ukraine. But Lord, we know of many other places where loss of life is a daily occurrence because of war. Affect the minds of leaders, Lord, so that they might bring an end to war and make decisions that make for peace. We pray for those without food, shelter, and clothing, be it here in the U.S. or in some far corner of the world. We pray that we might give so that they might have. We pray for our leaders, be they local, state, or federal. Grant them your wisdom so that they might make good and right decisions. This morning we pray for our sister church, the Schuylkill Church of the Brethren. Bless their ministry, Lord, in the Pine Grove area. We pray for our own pastors and leaders here at Lancaster. Grant them your discernment, your energy, your spirit, so that your kingdom might increase here in this time and place. Bless Pastor Don as he breaks to us the bread of life this morning. Open our hearts and minds to what your spirit might say to us and bless our continued worship this morning. For we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to do a switcheroozy on you this morning. That's probably not a word, so don't try it in Scrabble. Uh, uh, the flowers on the communion table are given by John Hank Kerr in memory of his wife, Teresa. They would have celebrated 72 years of marriage on June 18th. That's very special. One of their favorite hymns, which we're going to sing, is number 577, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. So would you stand and join in singing that hymn?
glad you kept singing. It was a little tight me getting here this morning. I guess I shouldn't have stopped to read the paper along the way from the other service. <laughs> New York Times columnist David Brooks recently wrote a column sharing nuggets of uh, wisdom that he had gleaned from a variety of sources. The title was The Greatest Life Hacks in the World for Now. And I enjoyed reading the various bits of advice that he provided, which ranged from the amusing to the practical to, to the borderline profound. And let me share just a few of them with you. He said, if you think you saw a mouse, you did. And if there is one, there are others. If you're not sure you can carry it all, take two trips. Very practical. The thing that made you weird as a kid could make you great as an adult. It's not an apology if it comes with an excuse. And I edited this one a little bit to make my wife happy. If you meet a difficult person once a month, you've met a difficult person. If you meet difficult people every day, you're a difficult person. <laughs> and finally, anything you say before the word but doesn't count. It's that last one that I'm going to try to work my way back around to this morning. Anything you say before the word but doesn't count. And I, I think we probably all do this. We start out by saying something positive about someone or something. But then comes the but, after which we get around to saying what we really mean to say. Uh, the potential employer says to the job applicant, it's obvious that you are a very capable person with many excellent qualifications, but I'm afraid you aren't a good match for this position. The niceties that came before the but are quickly forgotten in such a case. And we probably use but sentences negatively like this more often than positively, saving the zinger for after the but. But sometimes it can go the opposite way. That might sound something like this. You have made a terrible mistake that's going to really have some tough consequences. But together, we can get through this. In this case, the mistake isn't what matters most. It's what happens after the but that counts. There's still hope. Brian Stevenson from the Equal Justice Initiative frequently reminds us that each of us is more than the worst thing that we have ever done. You may have done something very bad, even committed a crime, but you are more than just a criminal. In our text for today, it's the story in Acts 3 of, of Peter healing a lame man who had been lame from birth. And, and this is the first of many healings in the book of Acts. A couple chapters later in Acts 5 verses 12 to 16, Luke summarizes, now many signs and wonders were done among the people through the apostles. People brought the sick and those tormented by evil spirits and they were all cured. Later in Acts chapter 20, Paul even raised a young man named Eutychus from the dead. Maybe you remember that story. I think Paul felt a little obligated to do so because he had more or less preached Eutychus to death. Paul had been speaking for hours and Eutychus was sitting on the sill of an open third floor window. He fought sleep but finally fell asleep and fell out the window uh, and met his demise right around midnight. You would think that Paul might have learned his lesson, but after he went down and raised Eutychus back up from the dead, it says Paul kept on talking until dawn. I hope he at least closed the window. <laughs> at any rate, throughout the book of Acts, we read of God giving these miraculous signs to alert people that a new day was dawning, a new kingdom was present. And these signs and wonders, along with the powerful preaching of the apostles and others like Stephen in the face of persecution, fueled the growth of the early church. In our story today, we read of this man who had been lame from birth, and every day his friends or relatives would lay him at the temple gate so that he could beg for a living from the people who came to the temple to worship or pray. Later in chapter 4, we learn that this man was more than 40 years old, so he may have been begging for decades. Peter and John likely saw him before. Maybe they even had given him alms. But on this day, they were short on cash. So when the lame man asked them for alms, 
Peter issued his now famous reply, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And it says he, he reached out his right hand and he helped his man to his feet and he walked and then he leaped and he praised God. And the onlookers who had seen this man many times before sitting there on that mat were astonished. And that's where we stopped reading the story. But it continues throughout the rest of chapter 3 and, and into chapter 4. After healing the lame man, Peter takes the opportunity to address the crowd, explaining to them that what had just taken place was not through his own power or piety, but through Jesus. And then in a sermon that sounded a lot like the one that he had preached on Pentecost, Peter reminded them of how they had rejected Jesus and called on them then to repent and believe in the power of the resurrected Christ. And many evidently did because Acts 4.4 says that the 3,000 believers that we had on Pentecost now had swelled to 5,000. But I think next week when Misty preaches, we'll see that no good deed goes unpunished as the religious leaders would arrest Peter and John for this act of kindness. Well, as I reread the story this week, there were a few things that stood out to me, and I invite you to listen and think along with me as we walk back through the story. The first thing I noticed was that the opportunity for ministry for Peter and John came while they were on their way to somewhere else. It didn't appear to me that they got up that morning and pulled out their Google calendars and took a look and said, oh yeah, heal the lame man, that's what we're doing today. No. They were on their way to the temple to pray. They had no appointment with the unnamed lame man, unless you want to consider it a divine appointment. They simply happened upon him, were open to being used by God, and so God used them. We see the same thing at a number of places in Jesus' ministry. A few weeks ago, I preached at Landis Holmes on the story about Jesus raising Jairus' daughter from the dead, and I, I noted that uh, we don't know what Jesus had planned to do that day, but as soon as Jairus made his plea, Jesus set out for the village to help his dying daughter. We also see the opposite taking place in Scripture, where people stuck to their plans and ignored God's call. The most familiar of those probably is the story of the Good Samaritan, where two religious leaders avoided the man who had been robbed and beaten and lay dying on the road. They actually crossed over to the other side of the road so that they wouldn't have to get involved. And it was left to a, a hated Samaritan to do the right thing. And it was the Samaritan who uh, bound up the man's wounds and took him to where he could be nursed back to health and footed the bill for his care. Two men who should have known better failed to respond. They had other plans. They averted their eyes and passed by on the other side. It would have been easy for Peter and John to do the same with the lame man, and we've all done it, or at least I, maybe I should speak for myself and say that I've done it, literally passing by people on the street who are looking for money or some kind of help, or I've also done it figuratively, declining to get involved, refusing to see, which brings me to my second observation. In verse 4, Luke highlights the eye contact that Peter and John made with the beggar. It says, Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And the beggar responded by fixing his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. It's harder to ignore someone when we've looked them in the eye, when we've made that human connection. I think that's why we avoid eye contact when we pass a panhandler on the street. And this dynamic plays out in a broader sense as well. It's harder to treat something as an abstract issue when we have faced those whose lives are directly impacted by that issue. And so we look away, unwilling to see, afraid that we might have to change our plans or change our minds if we make eye contact. I think some of the most 
vexing and divisive issues in our country today, things like gun violence and immigration and abortion and criminal justice, even sexuality, might be more fruitfully and compassionately discussed if we had more face-to-face -face relationships with people who are most directly impacted by these issues. More than one Christian has changed their views when abstract issues became concrete in their own families. Things look different when faces are attached, especially if they are faces of people we love and care about. If all of us had lost a child in that classroom in Uvalde, Texas the other week, would we still not have the will to place reasonable limits on military-style guns? Would we still allow young men who aren't old enough to buy a beer go and buy an assault rifle? How many more children will have to die before we're willing to acknowledge that our country's uniquely permissive gun culture and laws need to change? Peter and John looked intently at the lame man. They didn't see a lazy freeloader, or a drain on society, some abstract poverty or welfare issue. They saw a fellow human being, a child of God, in need, and they sought to meet his need. Now, the interesting thing about the man's need was that even he didn't seem to know what he needed most. Or at least, after decades of begging at the temple gate, he'd given up hope that he could receive the healing that he surely must have desired. He was, he was asking for money, but what he needed was healing. And we have far too many people like that in our world who are trying to satisfy their needs without, without really understanding what those needs are, or at least how those needs could be met. Some seeking acceptance join gangs or hate groups where they're given a sense of belonging. Some seeking love enter into sexual relationships that are not based on mutual respect and commitment and they end up with, with untold heartache. Some dealing with feelings of inferiority or rejection or anger or depression think they need a gun to go and make a name for themselves by shooting up a store or a school or a church or a synagogue. Some seeking power or purpose dedicate their lives to pursuing wealth, climbing over others in the process, and never quite finding the fulfillment that they seek. So many people who end up being harmed by others or harming themselves or harming others do these things because they don't understand what they really need or if they do understand, they don't know how to get those needs met in appropriate ways. It's like the old country song, they were looking for love in all the wrong places. And that brings us back around to, to David Brooks's adage about nothing that comes before the but matters. In response to the man who asked for money, Peter replied in Acts 3, 6, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. He began with, I have no silver or gold, but that came before the but. What mattered was what came after. But what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. Now, if Peter and John had focused just on what they didn't have, that conversation with the beggar would have been very different and very short. Probably would have gone something like, you want money? Sorry, we didn't have time to stop by the ATM this morning. Have a nice day, be well. But they didn't focus on what they didn't have, but on what they did. And what they did have was far better than money. Now, adding to the tragedy of all the people in our world who are looking for what they need in, in all the wrong places is that the church, when it truly is being the church, has what people need. Love, acceptance, purpose, power. We specialize in those things. 
As far as love, we, we serve a God who loves us so much that he gave himself up for us on the cross. Acceptance. We have a Savior who welcomes us despite our failings, forgives us, and empowers us to overcome whatever keeps us down or holds us back. Purpose. We've got nothing less than a calling to transform the world by following Jesus and inviting others to join us in his eternal kingdom. Power. We are made in the image of God, and the spirit of the creator of the universe dwells within each of us. Who needs Marvel superheroes? Our problem is that sometimes we continue to focus on what comes before the but. We fixate on what we don't have rather than celebrating and sharing what we do. I think we do it both as individuals and as a church, and surely both as individuals and as a church, we, we have our shortcomings, but we also have Jesus. And if we have Jesus, love Jesus, and follow Jesus, none of those shortcomings that came before the but really matter. We have more than enough to meet our own needs and to meet the needs of others. But it's true, we can't give what we don't have. For Peter and John, what they didn't have was money. I'm not sure that's our problem. Uh, we, we scrape and we scratch to fund our church plan and ministry here most years, but I don't think we really have a money shortage. We're a fairly wealthy church. There's a story told about an encounter that the Catholic theologian Thomas Aquinas had with Pope Innocent II. As the story goes, Aquinas entered into the Pope's presence and the Pope was there looking with satisfaction of a large amount of money and, that was uh, scattered out on the table there in front of him. And the Pope, rather triumphantly, quoting from this very story that we're looking at today, he said to Aquinas, you see, the church is no longer in that age in which she said, silver and gold, have I none. And Aquinas replied, true, Holy Father, but neither can she any longer say to the lame, rise up and walk. We have money. Do we have genuine spirituality? Do we have the kind of saving faith that James talks about in James 2, a faith in Jesus that's proven true by the works that accompany it? Peter and John offered the beggar what they themselves had received, the power of the risen Christ. We can't give what we don't have. One final thing I noticed in the story, not only did Peter offer to give what he had, but it says in verse 7 that Peter took the man by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. Now, it was God who made the feet and the ankles strong. But it was Peter's extended hand that raised the man to his feet. It was Peter's hand and God's power working together that raised the man up. Now, truthfully, I'm not really sure why Peter's hand was, was even necessary. If God could heal the man's legs, he also certainly could have raised the man to his feet without Peter's help. But it seems like that's how God works. He uses our hands. Isn't that one of the lessons of the story of the feeding of the 5,000 that's told in, I think, all the Gospels? You remember how Jesus multiplied the little boys, loaves, and fishes to feed everybody, and when all was said and done, they had 12 baskets of leftovers. Jesus didn't need those loaves and fishes to feed the crowd. God had proved way back in, in Exodus that he was qualified and no doubt safe serve certified to feed large groups of people in an efficient and safe way. In response to his people's cries back then, God had whipped up a hearty meal of manna and then later added quail on very short notice without so much as a box of manna helper stocking in his, stocked in his cupboard. But in the feeding of the 5,000, God didn't cook from scratch. God took what the people offered and multiplied it and used his followers 
to distribute it. Now, some who are uncomfortable with the miraculous have conjectured that what really happened that day was that the people were inspired to share what they already had, and, and once they open, opened their hands to each other, they found that they had more than enough. I don't, I don't think that's what happened. I think Jesus really did multiply the loaves and the fishes. But just getting people to share what they had also would have been an accomplishment. Not quite miraculous, but, but almost. My point is that when we recognize what we have and offer it to God and others, God uses it, and sometimes great things happen. On the other hand, if we dwell on what we don't have or refuse to share what we do, the hungry go unfed, the lame remain sitting on their mat, the rejected never find love and acceptance, people without purpose remain unfulfilled, and those seeking eternal life fail to find it. Moses said he couldn't possibly lead his people out of slavery in Egypt because he wasn't qualified. But God used him anyway. The judge Gideon was hiding from the Midianites trying to thresh wheat in a wine press, which I understand is a difficult thing to do. But God called him a mighty man of valor and used him to deliver Israel from its enemies. Isaiah declared himself a man of unclean lips, unfit to be God's messenger. But God cleansed his lips and spoke through him, used him to point forward to the coming Messiah. The Apostle Paul first was the persecutor, Saul. But God used him to carry the gospel far and wide, and we continue to benefit from his wisdom in the scriptures. John Newton was a captain of a slave ship and an investor in the slave trade. But eventually God used him to help abolish slavery in England and to write a beloved hymn that we still sing today, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. In all of these examples and in many others, what comes before the but doesn't matter. It's what comes after. What matters is our willingness to surrender our lives to Jesus, to look with empathy into the eyes of others, to focus not on what we lack but what we have, and to offer to others what we ourselves have received. When we extend an outstretched hand, God uses our efforts to transform lives and make people whole. May it be so.
may be seated. Close with these words from Paul, Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all that we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.